Almost overnight, she went from a possible witness to a person of interest in the case of a missing mom of five from New Canaan. The girlfriend in the middle of a bitter and brutal divorce battle. The stuff you were throwing out, we have. And it's all Jennifer. It belongs to Jennifer. Do you understand? Turned high profile murder investigation. Guys, what happened to Jennifer Michelle? We're taking you inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. And thanks for joining us once again for Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. I'm Shanna Miller. We're preparing for a major milestone in this case. The prosecution expected to rest after calling its final witness, the mother of Jennifer Dulos. Gloria Farber has never given an interview or spoken publicly about her daughter's disappearance. While Farber likely has insight into the contentious divorce and custody battle with her estranged son-in-law at the time, Fotis Dulos, it's unclear what she could testify on when it comes to the defendant, Michelle Traconis. Traconis faces several charges, including conspiracy to commit murder. The prosecution wrapped up testimony about the third interview Draconis gave to police. The jury heard from the defendant in her own words about that smoke coming out of the chimney at Fort Jefferson Crossing and the alleged inconsistencies in her story, according to investigators. You have to think about how the whole story is going to sound to 12 people sitting in the jury box. And we got an update from the judge about the timing of this trial and how much longer it could go. NBC Connecticut's Kevin Geis joining us now live once again outside Stanford Superior Court. And Kevin, it appears that issue of contempt is going to push back the closing arguments. Most likely, Shannon, good morning. We learned directly from Judge Kevin Randolph in his own words that it, this will likely go now well beyond March 1st. After the jury was dismissed for the day Tuesday, Judge Randolph laid out a roadmap for how the rest of the trial will proceed. After the defense rests, the defendant will face a contempt hearing for that issue of what may have been shown on her laptop in court. The state alleges that Traconis had a copy of a sealed custody evaluation on her laptop in full view of the gallery and the pool camera. A friend of Jennifer is the one who saw it and tipped off prosecutors. Traconis' attorney, John Schoenhorn, telling reporters, to his knowledge, his client doesn't have the report, and he certainly did not give it to her. So Judge Randolph saying Tuesday the jury needs a heads up that this is going to take longer than expected. So there are many, as the cliche goes, moving parts here. The court wants to try to make sure that the jury is not surprised and informed that, well, we're going to be here a lot longer than March 1st. So here's that roadmap of the trial ahead. The prosecution is expected to rest today. Then the defense presents its case. John Schoenhorn is, is expected to take about three or four days to do that. After the defense rests, then the contempt hearing will be held. It's unclear how long that will take. Then closing arguments after that, the jury will deliberate. If Draconis is found in contempt, sanctions won't be imposed until the verdict is reached and read. Then would come sentencing if she is found guilty. Now, a reminder, we're down to just two alternate jurors on top of the regular jurors. So as we creep closer to that March 1st overestimate the jurors were given, of course, big concerns are continuing. And Kevin Attorney John Schoenhorn told the judge that he and his co-counsel Audrey Felsen decided that it would be inappropriate to represent Michelle Draconis in the contempt hearing given the nature of the allegation and that Draconis has been reaching out to other counsel to represent her in that contempt hearing. What else did Attorney John Schoenhorn say in his explanation as to why it would be better for him to not represent Draconis in that case? Right. Defense Attorney John Schoenhorn pointed out to us reporters last week that he does not know exactly what was going on behind him when those allegations were made. He was in the middle of cross-examination, so he wasn't paying attention to what was going on behind him. But he, again, he did make clear that if she does have a copy of that report, she most certainly did not get it from him. But to his knowledge, she does not have a copy of that report. Shannon. Kevin, we got an update on a big name on the witness list. Kent Mawinney, the friend and attorney of Photos Dulos, the only other person charged as a co-conspirator in the death of Jennifer Dulos. He faces a charge of conspiracy to commit murder. Assistant State's Attorney Sean McGinnis says Mawinney again, that friend of Photos Dulos, 
and his attorney at one point is unavailable as a witness to either party and is invoking his Fifth Amendment right. The Fifth Amendment protects people from being forced to potentially incriminate themselves. He was on a potential witness list for both the prosecution and the defense, so it appears we will not be hearing from him during this trial. According to the Connecticut Judicial website, Kit Winnie's criminal case is on the trial list and is set to be scheduled. Moving on now to the third interview Michelle Draconis gave police. It's the first time investigators asked about the chimney spoke that we first heard about on Friday. Investigators tell her they saw home surveillance video from the neighbor's home showing smoke, indicating that a fire was still burning while Draconis was with Drillus as he threw out garbage bags along Albany Avenue in Hartford. Why is there a fire in your chimney? What time did I at home. But there is smoke billowing out of your chimney. Yeah, I don't think there was like smoke out of the chimney. Uh, yeah, there was a smoke. I smoked. Yeah, there, there's, there was video from your neighbor's house. Mm -hmm. There was energy yeah. fire. Tons of smoke yeah. billowing out of it. So when you guys are in Hartford, you have a nice fire burning with nobody home. And it's all recorded on video, so I do think Michelle that it happens. I'm not going to just make stuff no, up. No, I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I do turn that chimney a lot. What were you guys burning? Wood. It was beautiful. But okay, okay, and I do wood. My mom came on Friday and I did wood. You were outside the shores and you're having a fire in the house? I do fire every day, it doesn't matter. Every day? But and you leave it burning when you leave the house? No, it wasn't burning when we leave the house. I don't think it was burning. It must have been. Oh, yeah, I think so because we have video of you in the car in Hartford. No, I think it's not the same thing. At the same time, we have video of your house and it comes to smoke coming out of you. Now, Draconis tells investigators she had a fire burning around 5.30, but according to Kimball's testimony, she never said she set a fire in the fireplace at the other time. Smoke was seen coming out of the chimney around 2.56 p.m. and 3.25 p.m. Assistant State's Attorney McGinnis showed the handwritten timelines allegedly written by Fotis Dulos and Michelle Draconis. He pointed out that Dulos's timeline said Andreas called and spoke briefly. McGinnis then showed the photocopy of Traconis's timeline. Kimball testified that between 8.12 and 8.30 a.m., there's no indication in that timeline that she answered the phone call. And nowhere on the timeline does it say she lit a fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Now, during the third interview, Traconis says it was Fotis who told her to write the timeline. And I still don't feel that you've given, at least for me, a valid reason as to why you followed Fotis' script when we first sat down. I want you to explain to me why did you tell us things that you knew were false? Okay, I was in shock. I was nervous. Um, Fotis, when he told Pavel and I to write the um, timeline, you said you call it script, he was like, yeah, he wrote it and he was telling what to say or what to write. Now, Kevin, in cross-examination, attorney Schoenhorn emphasizing Fotis' involvement in Michelle writing a timeline. What she said was that, that Fotis Dulles was trying to tell her certain things to say, like he was saying things out loud that he was hoping she would include, right? Which she did, the shower, in her timeline. Uh, he's referencing to the line took shower with Fotis written in that timeline in which she told police happened in her first interview. So, Kevin, this continues to be a defense strategy and cross-examination and maybe a preview of their case that it's about what Fotis told Michelle about what was going on. Right. The defense continues to sort of push this idea that Fotis Dulos was contaminating Michelle Traconis's memory, that he was offering up certain events or certain things that she should put in the timeline or what ended up in the timeline. That's why they matched up so well uh, and why certain things were omitted as well. The defense also plans to bring up memory in their defense as well, something we're expecting to hear from a few experts uh, once we get to defense testimony directly. Uh, so we continue to we're expecting these timelines to continue to come back up, but specifically specifically around memory, as well as what Fotis Dulos told Michelle Traconis to add to those timelines.
And Kevin, later on in the interview, Kimball shows Dracotas a picture on his phone of a bicycle. He asks if it's similar to a style of one that Fotis owned, and here's what Michelle had to say about that bike. Where is that bike now? Do you happen to know where that bike was the last time you saw that bike? In the That's the last time. Is it, is it back? Well, you're not back. Mm -hmm. And I, when I went to pick up the bicycles, I, I don't remember seeing it. At Jefferson? When I went to pick up my clothes. At Jefferson? At Jefferson. Okay, but that book that you pointed out, there, Cloudy, that's normally where it would hang. Yes. Far away. Yeah. Now, you might remember back in January, investigators walked the jury through their searches of Fotis Dulos's properties, including the garage at Fort Jefferson Crossing. This is where he would normally keep that bike, according to detectives, on a hook on the wall. And here's what investigators say the garage at 80 Mountain Spring Road looked like. It's virtually empty and pretty clean. Dracotas told police in her interview that that's the last place that she saw Fotis's bike. Well, Cross-examination, John Schoenhorn pressed the lead detective about the lack of evidence found at the 80 Mountain Spring home. The evidence that we were operating on was the to and from activity to and from 80 Mountain Spring and the Toyota Tacoma specifically. Yeah, my question is, at the location itself, not people driving to and from, what evidence was, was found at 80 Mountain Spring Road? during the course of your investigation prior to your interrogation on August 13th? I believe we found, we found any. Nothing, right? Not Zero. in the interior. It was all happening on the, in the driveway. What did you find in the driveway? I don't know that anything was found in the driveway, but we found... You know, so Kimball just kind of stops there, pauses there, shakes his head. Uh, so Kevin, again, no physical evidence that we have heard about that's been found at 80 Mountain Spring Road. Yet years later, we know that this property was later searched with an excavator and with the help of a bone finder expert. Makes you wonder what investigators, Kevin, thought could have happened here. Right. The defense continues to point that nothing happened there, and that's sort of their narrative that they're going with. But prosecutors sort of allow the jury to sort of come to their own conclusion. They sort of have to draw their own reasonable inferences, which we know the judge is totally allowing as fair game uh, in sort of this case. Prosecutors alleging that it's not necessarily what exactly happened there, but just the movements that are so important around 80 Mountain Spring. That's why they spent hours uh, combing through all sorts of surveillance video from across the street. Uh, so there's still sort of a large mystery about what happened at 80 Mountain Spring, and uh, but we won't really necessarily ever know because there was no surveillance video attached to that property specifically. Uh, this is going to come down to what the jury decides uh, which sort of narrative they want to go with. Uh, Kevin, I want to talk now about one of the more intense parts of that interview. On Monday, the jury heard from Draconis about what she called physical contact with Fotis Dulos against that Tacoma between her and her then boyfriend, investigators pressed her about this. So that's, that's where your boyfriend wanted to have sex with you on the side of the door of the car. And where do you think that belongs to? Who do you think that belongs to? And this is it. And he wants to do well with you with the door open. Okay. okay. So apparently, Jennifer's blood makes him warm. So if you know stuff that you're not telling us. Oh That's the man you're protecting, because that's I'm not sick protecting him. I'm not protecting him. Now on the stand, Detective Kimball explained the tactics used in this part of the interview. Could you tell the jury what Detective Clabby showed the defendant? Detective Clabby showed the defendant a photograph of the inside of the passenger door of the Tacoma, which had a reaction to luminol, positive reaction. Um, and uh, Detective Clabby sort of hints that perhaps uh, the luminol is reacting to Jennifer Dulos' blood. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. But in fact, there were no DNA results on that door linked to Jennifer Dulos, correct? That is correct, yes. Is that an example of a false evidence play? It is, yes. And then you said um, apparently Jennifer's blood makes him horny. Detective, would you agree that that is an emotionally charged comment? Absolutely. Why did you make that comment? It was designed to be emotionally charged because the statement by Detective Clabby just prior to that is she only gives us information when she gets angry. That, if that statement was basically de designed to get a strong emotional reaction out of her. And she, in fact, did give us more information following that, that statement. 
Now, Campbell said the detectives still had concerns Draconis was withholding information, so their strategy was to turn up the heat on her. In the interview, Draconis also indicates why she may have picked up that alleged alibi call from Fotis' friend, Andreas, of a size kit Mawini telling her to do so. Sometimes Fotis writes the name of women in man's name. Did you suspect that that might be an awful woman? Yes. Okay. So Michelle, they're saying that she thought that a woman could have been calling Fotis and that Andreas's number could have been saved uh, by the name of Andreas, but actually another woman on the other line. And we have heard her interactions that Michelle was suspicious of Fotis having more contact with Jennifer Dulos than he was letting on and that the two may have actually been on speaking terms. Detectives try to play into Michelle's suspicions that Fotis was unfaithful in that third interview when they show her a photo of Fotis with another woman. So were detectives trying to get an emotional reaction out of Michelle here? Kevin, does it seem like that tactic worked for them? They claim it did. Uh, we hear from police investigators multiple times that a lot of the evidence that was key in drafting their arrest warrants, as well as uh, just sort of pulling together the investigation, they were eliciting out of Michelle Traconis during some of these more emotional statements when they were pressing her, as you said, turning up the heat during these interviews. So this is something that uh, investigators believe was incredibly important to them and ultimately uh, paid off when it came time to draft uh, the arrest warrants. Kevin, guys, live outside Stanford Superior Court once again. Court starting a little bit early today. Here in about 15 minutes, we'll let you get inside. More of Inside the Trial, Michelle Traconis coming up. We're digging into the issue of a contempt hearing, pushing back, closing arguments with attorney Jim Bergen. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. We are joined once again by one of our legal analysts, Jim Bergen. Uh, Jim, let's talk about this roadmap that Judge Randolph has set out and laid out for the rest of the trial. The contempt hearing now going to happen after the defense rests, before those closing arguments. Uh, the jury being warned it could go longer than that March 1st deadline. Uh, talk about why the judge made the decision that he did, citing Draconis' Sixth Amendment uh, right to a defense, but also considering, of course, how long this jury has already uh, served and how much longer they need to be mentally prepared for? Well, when the judge used the colloquial term moving parts, he was essentially admitting his own predicament. He's trying to accomplish so many different things. His most important goal is to be sure this jury independently and objectively scrutinizes the evidence in this case. The idea that we're going to overlap that with this sidebar contempt issue which really has nothing to do directly because none of it was seen by the jury. It's behavior that needs attention, but does it need attention in the middle of this trial? I think the judge may end up reconsidering it because I'm not sure how it helps anything. And Judge Randolph even calling this contempt hearing a rare case. Uh, even Attorney John Schoenhorn saying that uh, he recommends that he and his co-counsel, Audrey Velson, not represent Michelle in this uh, uh, this part of the, the trial, this part of the case, this contempt hearing, uh, and saying that Traconis is now looking for other counsel to represent her in that part of it. Can you explain, again, this is rare for a, a contempt hearing to happen to begin with, but explain that reasoning behind Attorney Schoenhorn saying that he and Attorney Felsen cannot represent her for the contempt part of this. Well, he offered some reasoning, and there's even better reasoning than what he offered, which is, when somebody is being charged with doing something that's a violation of the law, a contempt hearing, they have a right to counsel, but the lawyer's role in that is always in question. So anytime a lawyer's own conduct is in question, that's a conflict because you can't have that influence the finding of facts. So for them to step out makes a lot of sense. For them to be doing this now when this other lawyer, whoever it's going to be, needs time to examine it, needs to 
talked to her in some detail about privileged conversations she had with them. For example, one question is, did they school her enough on, hey, you can't do anything like that? Or we still don't even know anything as to what this was that she was looking at. Why is it contemptuous? We just don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you have said throughout all of this is uh, what was Michelle's state of mind uh, throughout the investigation, throughout the questioning? Uh, we got a, a look at what Attorney John Schoenhorn is hoping to accomplish in his part of the trial here, a preview from him on how he plans to start his defense. He plans to call two expert witnesses on memory and interrogation, including one who specializes in how people uh, who have English, you know, not as their first language react to and process questions. It seems like uh, he's really going to try to tackle those inconsistencies that investigators allege Michelle Tracona's made in her interviews with them. It's, a, it's actually very appropriate. Um, I was thinking at first it's another sideshow, but on the other hand, I know these experts, not personally, but I've been reading about them for decades. They really do know what they're talking about. And given now that we have seen more of this last interview, we get to see her behavior. And for the most part, I think it comes across somewhat natural for someone who's just being attacked, attacked, attacked. The police that are interrogating her, they're not looking for the truth. That's not their job. Their job is to find any evidence of probable cause. So when they're attacking her and saying these very obnoxious things in order to get a reaction, you can't do that in a courtroom. You know why? Because we know that's not how you produce truth. What you do is you produce uh, something. Okay, so she, whatever she produces, they're just saying, oh, do, can we put that in our list of probable cause? So it's real, the whole thing is a bit of a mess right now, and I think Schoenhorn and Felsen, the two lawyers, are doing well to just stand away from that. And then let's focus, help this jury, again, focus on her mind. That's the whole trial. One of the biggest uh, takeaways from yesterday was that uh, the alleged co-defendant in the case, co-conspirator in the case, uh, Kent Mawinney, um, mm. is saying, uh, made indication to the court that he is unavailable, that he will be invoking his Fifth Amendment right. He still has a trial pending uh, for the criminal charges that he faces. What do you think and make of this that Kent Mawinney has decided that he will not be participating in Michelle Draconis's trial? Very smart move on his part. His case is completely different from Michelle. Re remember, Michelle's encounter with Fotis is Fotis is put on a show from the minute he met her until his own death, okay? His whole show is, I'm just a wonderful guy, you really ought to be going out with me, and someday you can even take care of my five kids. You know, even if it's just part time. Like, I don't think she could have imagined this killing. But this other guy, he is just a, an odd guy who is talking about their spouses, you know, and, and burial plots. It's just the whole thing is so weird uh, that I think it's great not to even have that sideshow. All right, Jim, we appreciate that. And coming up, we will talk more about the preparation that goes into a high-profile trial just like this as the defense gets ready for its turn. We'll be right back. I work at a certain level of intensity and I stay at that intensity till uh, the case is in the jury's hands and I can't do anything else about it. Attorney John Schoenhorn answering <laughs> questions uh, Tuesday about how he's feeling as he gets ready to present his client's defense. He told reporters he is running on adrenaline at this point. Welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. We are joined once again by attorney Jim Bergen. Uh, Jim, I have spoken with John Schoenhorn uh, countless times, dozens of times throughout the course of the last several years that he has represented Michelle Draconis. Um, how much of a grind is this for both sides, the defense and the prosecution? There has been so much behind the scene works, that transfer of uh, evidence. Um, what goes into all of this uh, as far as the experience from preparing for, uh, for a trial like this? Well, it is very demanding. It is very exhilarating. Um, if anybody knows Dan Hurley, you know what it's like to be a trial lawyer. It takes incredible, intense concentration at all times. And then you got to gather yourself and you got to present differently. So I've been involved in these cases myself. I had a Wells Fargo case. I had the Trash Hours case. Multiple defendants, months and months, hundreds of thousands of documents, and that's what he's had to do. When that happens, it's very motivating, it's very exciting, but then you gotta calm yourself down. Mm -hmm. it's, a, 
it's just about as exhilarating a human experience as you can have. And it is, the experience is different for the state and the defense. You know, the defense is really kind of at the mercy as to a lot of times when they get their hands on the facts of the case. Yeah, and, and, and prosecutors, the work is kind of handed to them by the law enforcement officers. They've got a lot of resources. You know, you're looking at the two resources when you're watching, uh, you know, Audrey and John walking along. That's them. They may have a paralegal or a couple of staff that are helping them here and there, but it's all on them. It's very intense. I think they're doing a decent job. And all of that expected, again, to begin with that testimony, that expert testimony on memory, recollection, how that could affect um, potentially the statements that Michelle Draconis gave to investigators. I think it'll help the jury understand some things. All right. Jim, we always appreciate your insight. We'll have you back once again soon. That wraps up our exclusive Inside the Trial Michelle Tracona streaming special. Our live stream from Stanford Superior Court begins here shortly. Thanks for watching.